you heard uh, that last week some of us were in the Hampton Ministers Conference in Virginia. That's where we go every year right after church anniversary for some respite and to be replenished, to be refreshed by the Word of God. And we were certainly refreshed by the Word of God this past week as so many sisters and brothers preached to us and blessed us with the Word of God. And were kind enough to tell us they were praying for us as a church family. And several people shared their Bill Lawson reflections. As I was walking through the halls of Hampton Ministers Conference, people just kept coming up to me, your pastor did this. And I remember when Pastor Lawson said this, and I remember when he did this. And one such person, Bishop Watson Scott Thomas, he walked up to me and he said, man, I was thinking about Pastor Lawson. He said, I watched the whole service, five and a half hours. I just sat in my house and watched the whole thing. And he said, I remember when I heard Bill Lawson preach a series of sermons entitled Conversations with Jesus. <laughs> I said, Bishop, you just gave us our summer series. All summer long, I want to talk about conversations with Jesus. Conversations with Jesus. That's what I want to deal with. And those who will preach throughout the summer will deal with the same conversations with Jesus. And to begin those conversations, we start at the space where our executive pastor read for us in Luke chapter 7. I return your attention to Luke chapter 7. I just want to read a portion of the 7th verse of the 7th chapter of the New Testament gospel of the Lord Jesus as recorded by Luke. Luke chapter 7 verse 7. Now, now if, you don't, if you don't have a long history with the Baptist church, what I'm about to say to you may not make any difference at all. But if you're old school Baptist, this is going to make a little difference. When I, when I grew up, I grew up going to BTU old school old school and btu was where you learned where the books of the bible were so you didn't get confused with luke from leviticus you know you had to, you knew where chronicles was and where corinthians was it was a difference right and when we were growing up we they taught us how to say certain things that, with regard to the scriptures and uh, one of the things with, what i'm going to do today is look at the second portion of verse seven and when they taught us to do that they said it's not just the second portion it's verse seven b yeah, so that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at verse 7b of chapter 7 of the New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke. And from the New International Version, here are the words of Scripture. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. What time that is ours to share together on this Sunday afternoon, I want to talk from the subject, the power of the spoken word. The power of the spoken word. Children learned nursery rhymes back in the day. I don't know if they still do. But nursery rhymes were a way of developing children and helping them to understand the ways of the world. Unfortunately, one of the nursery rhymes that was taught to children included a fallacy of epic proportion. I mean, it ain't true. <laughs> it went a little something like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That, that's so untrue. Somebody just said liar. Lord have mercy. <laughs> The Pentecostals said that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's what they said. It's just not true. <laughs> it's not true at all because all of us who have been ill-affected by words know the way that words can bruise you and you never see the scar. Words can hurt you in ways that will walk with you, go through life with you, and never let you go. There's some people who heard some things as children that have affected them even into their adult years. There are some things that people have said to adults that have kept them held hostage and bound when they should have been thriving and flourishing. Words can hurt you. So I prefer to use scripture as my basis of understanding words because Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
and we who love them eat the fruits thereof, it is to say that you can speak life into a situation just as you can speak death into a circumstance, that you can speak life into your family just as you can speak death into your family. You can speak joy into your family just as with the wrong words you can speak depression into your family. I suspect that all of us need to grow to use words to help people to ensure people's growth and development development and prosperity instead of bringing people down with our words. I submit this Sunday afternoon that you and I have the awesome opportunity to use our words in such a way that people's lives will be better. We can use our words to ensure that people have joy instead of hurt and hate, that people have the opportunity for peace instead of tumult and chaos, that you and I can speak words to develop instead of words that diminish. I want us to be people of God who speak life into other people's lives even as we speak life into our own lives. Listen, would you believe that you can tell yourself the right thing long enough and it will help you to hold your head up high and believe that there is nothing impossible with God? Oh, I am grateful for the story of Brother David in the scriptures. The story says that David in encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What must that look like? It looks like somebody looking in the mirror telling yourself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It looks like somebody walking through the day saying, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. It looks like somebody who is going through a rough patch but still saying to oneself, weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. I wish I had somebody in here who knows how to pat your own self on the back. You know how to caulk yourself off the ledge. You know how to give yourself the pep talk that you need to keep on going. I wish I had two or three people who knew how to talk to themselves. Tell yourself, get yourself together. Tell yourself to lift up your head. Tell yourself you can do better than that. Tell yourself to put that smile on your face and believe that the God you serve is going to bring you through. Is there anybody who knows how to speak well to yourself yeah I like that we can speak words of life words to encourage words to uplift and my brothers and sisters it makes sense that we do this but listen let, let me tell you that you've got to use your words in the right way because when you use your words in the right way it matters speak words in the right way and speak words with the right tone because your tone matters hear me when I tell you the way you speak to other people in the right tone it it really does matter because you can say the right thing the wrong way and you never get the results you're intended for it to get that's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 that we are supposed to speak the truth in love I like the Bible readers in this church speak the truth in love and I know I know some of y'all pride yourself in having no filters I know you don't want to have any I say what I'm thinking I think what I'm saying Saying, but you can do harm to individuals when you say the right thing the wrong way. Your tone matters. The timing matters. If you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, it can set some people off. Be some furniture moving up in there. You got to be real careful to say the right thing in the right way at the right time with the right tone because if you don't, it can mess up a conversation or a situation that should have been going in the right direction and so I came to suggest that our words matter brothers and sisters that's why the old saints used to say watch your mouth it literally meant that you're not saying the right thing at the right time in the right way and before they knew it was abuse they say if you don't watch your mouth I'll wash your mouth out with soap that's that's abuse, y'all. That's abuse. Don't do that to the children. Don't do that to the children. And that's what used to happen. All of these things, my brothers and sisters, were an attempt to make sure that we use the right words at the right time, in the right way, with the right tone. And that, my dear friends, is precisely what's happening in this gospel as recorded by the writer Luke at chapter 7. In this first scene in Luke chapter 7, we see the Lord Jesus being confronted by individuals 
individuals who have come to him on behalf of a brother who has a servant who is sick. Watch that. That was convoluted. We see individuals coming to Jesus on behalf of a brother who has a servant who is sick. Third time is the charm. We see individuals coming to Jesus on behalf of a brother who has a servant who is sick. And that's what's going on in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 through 10 that there is this conversation with individuals and Jesus on behalf of a brother who has a servant who is sick. Let's use the terms that the scriptures use. The term is a centurion. Somebody say centurion. He is a military official who has at least 100 men under his authority. Centurion sent. Centurion has 100 men under his authority and one of his men is sick and lay at the point of death. If you were listening to Dr. Johnson Reed, you heard him say that one of those 100 men is sick and lay at the point of death and the centurion sent some elders from the group to go see Jesus. Okay, here it is. The centurion sent elders to Jesus to go see him about the servant who is sick. You still with me? There's a servant who is sick, a centurion who has authority over him. His centurion loves his servant so much that he calls for the elders to go get Jesus to come back to the house to heal his sick servant. Now, I like it, church family, but if you watch the text, you'll find out that this centurion is not a Jewish man. He's not a Hebrew. He is not from the family of the Israelites. He is not an Israelite. He is a Gentile. Whenever you hear the word Gentile, you read it, it literally means those who are outside of the Jewish faith. And this centurion who sends the elders to get Jesus on behalf of his servant is not a Jewish man he's a Gentile but he heard what Jesus was able to do yes Lord he is not in the family he is an other he is somebody beyond the family but he heard what Jesus could do and when he heard what Jesus could do your Bible says he sent elders Jewish elders to go get Jesus to come back to his house to heal his servant I like it and I want to submit today that these elders who went to Jesus went to Jesus with what I call a compelling argument Yes, a compelling argument. Watch the movements of the text. These elders provide a compelling argument. They go to Jesus as this centurion has sent them to do. And when they go to Jesus, your Bible says they meet Jesus and say, Jesus, we need you to come back to the centurion's house because he's a good man. He's a worthy man. As a matter of fact, he's such a good man. He loves our nation. He's not Jewish like we are, but he loves our nation so much so that he even built us a synagogue. He's a good man and he is worthy of you coming to see about him. And your Bible says that based upon their compelling argument, Jesus went with him. Okay, it didn't bless you like I wanted it to, so let me try and make it go this way. It's called Remix. Jesus sees these brothers, and they come and talk to him. And when they talk to him, they talk to him about a centurion who is not a Jewish man, but he loves God's people so much that he loves the nation, and he has built a synagogue for them. And he wants Jesus, they want Jesus to come to this man's house not for him alone, but to heal his servant who has sent the elders to Jesus to come back and heal because he heard that that man Jesus could heal like nobody else can. And so and so he sent the elders. And I want to suggest, if you'll permit me to use a different word for this, I want to suggest that what we're looking at here in Luke chapter 7 is a beautiful picture of intercession. Yes, intercession. If you've been walking with us at Wheeler Avenue for the last couple of months, you've heard us talking a lot about intercession. That's when somebody goes to Jesus on your behalf and pleads your case with Jesus so that your situation might be made better. And the Bible says that these men went to Jesus and if you watch the words of the text, New International Version says they earnestly pleaded with Jesus to come back to the house and and heal the sin.
centurion's servant. And I want to suggest on this Sunday afternoon that everybody at church today needs somebody who will go to Jesus on your behalf. I, I came to suggest today that everybody needs somebody who will go to Jesus and earnestly plead with Jesus to do something about your situation. Well, let me push it. I want to suggest today that everybody in here has had somebody to go to Jesus. <laughs> and earnestly plead with Jesus about your situation. Come here. You ain't no self-made man. You ain't no self-made woman. You had somebody talking to Jesus about your situation. You had somebody praying about your circumstance. Can I find seven people in every section who will testify if it hadn't been for my intercessors? Ain't no telling where I would be right now. If it hadn't been for somebody praying that I would get my act together, that I would stay in my right mind, that I would be a lover of God and his church ain't no telling where I would be but look at me up in church on a Sunday afternoon because somebody prayed for me yep. Whew. I need to find the people who took your wrong path at some season of your life you did your own thing your own way and you did it and you liked it come here come here you enjoyed every bit of it you strategized as to how you were going to do it next weekend if not by Wednesday I need somebody in here to testify that you were doing your own thing but somebody was back at the house saying Lord bless my baby Woo. Lord keep my child don't let him go too far don't let her lose her mind reel her back in Lord before it's everlasting too late that's what they used to say and look at you <laughs> with your Wheeler Avenue loving self and your God loving self sitting in church at 1244 on a Sunday afternoon talking about if it had not been <laughs> for the Lord who was on my side I want to suggest that all of us need some people in our lives who go to Jesus with a compelling argument. I need everybody in here to understand we need people in our lives who will intercede on our behalf. But can I push it a bit farther? After you've experienced intercession, at some point you need to become an intercessor. Preach, preach, preach. I said everybody in here who knows you've been the beneficiary of intercession at some point ought to become an intercessor. Stop letting everybody pray for you and you don't pray for anybody else. I need you to start praying for somebody that God will meet them at the point of their need and make a difference in their life. And according to the text, everybody doesn't have to be in your family. Oh, we good for, with praying for me and mine. But won't you expand your prayer circle a little bit and include somebody who's not in your family. Include somebody who ain't your boo or your bae. Include somebody who ain't sitting on your pew right now. When was the last time you prayed for your boss? I'm just asking. When was the last time you prayed for your co-workers? When was the last time you interceded for your direct reports or for those you supervise? When was the last time you prayed for those children you teach in your class? When was the last time you prayed for the superintendent? Lord, have mercy. When was the last time? When was the last time you prayed for governmental officials? The Bible tells us to do it. When was the last time you prayed for your enemies? Listen, I didn't say pray on your enemies. I said pray for your enemies. Because the Bible says that when you pray for your enemies, you heap hot coals on their head. You ain't got to hate on them like they hate on you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and mistreat you. That's Bible. That's Bible. I want to submit today that all of us need to make compelling arguments to Jesus for somebody else. I want to submit today that all of us need to talk to God on behalf of somebody else. It seems that the compelling argument worked 
Because verse 6 says, Jesus said, all right, let's go. Come on, let's go. Where we headed? Come on, let's make our way to the house. Now, this is good because it's not just the elders and Jesus. If you were listening, you heard that um, there's a large crowd following Jesus. And that's been his way ever since he started his ministry back in Luke chapter 4. There's been large crowds following him. He's going into Capernaum. He's going into this city, this little remote village on the northern sea of, seashore of Galilee. And while he's going, the Bible says this large crowd is following him. And as they're following him, they're headed to watch him do what he's been doing. What has he been doing? He's been healing. And now they get the first-hand ringside seat at a, at a miracle that Jesus is about to perform. Can't you see the expectation? Can't you see the heightened sensitivity to what Jesus is about to do? Their, their, their angelic antenna have, antenna have just gone up. They're about to watch Jesus perform a miracle. Can't you hear the folk in the crowd throw back? Go, Jesus, go, Jesus, go. Can't you hear them? They're excited because they're about to watch Jesus do what only Jesus can do. And while they're watching, the movement moves from a compelling argument to what I call conclusive authority. Somebody shout authority. We're about to see authority in our very, before our very eyes. Authority. Now, this man, Jesus, decides to go with the elders and this large crowd to the centurion's house. That was the request. Go to the centurion's house to heal his servant. And as they're going, the centurion sends some friends to Jesus and tells Jesus, don't come to my house because I'm not worthy for you to come inside my house. And this is intriguing to me. He says, I'm not worthy for you to come inside my house. He says, I'm a man of authority. I know what authority looks like. I, I got people under me. I got a hundred people who do what I tell them to do at all times. If I say, come here, they come here. If I say, go over there, they go over there. If I say, do this, they do exactly what I say do. If I say, jump, they say, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. We didn't even practice that, and y'all did it so well. They say, how high? I'm a man of authority, and I know that because of your authority, you can do whatever you choose to do. Now, this blesses me because I mentioned to you Luke chapter 4. Since chapter 4, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, we have learned about Jesus' authority, that he has authority. When you look at Luke chapter 4, verses 32 and 36, you will find out that every time Jesus spoke, the Bible says his word had power and authority. I like that Greek word authority, Melanie Lawson. That Greek word authority is the word exousia. It literally means the right, the permission, the ability, the power to do whatever you want to do. Oh, man, that didn't bless you. That Jesus has the right, the permission, the, uh, the power, the ability to do whatever he wants to do. And when he says it, it shall be done. That's what exousia means. And his words had that kind of authority that every time he spoke it, it came to pass. That one word from the Lord can literally change the trajectory of your life. That one word from the Lord, if you were listening to the music ministry this morning, can change you from being downtrodden to lifted up and testifying about the goodness of the Lord. One word from the Lord. And so, when you look at Luke chapter 4, you'll find out in the verse, first 12 verses, that Jesus and the devil have an encounter. That the enemy meets Jesus in the wilderness where he has been led by the spirit to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. And when he's in there, every time the devil tries to tempt him, Jesus whips him with the word. Read it, chapter 4. Read it when you get home. He tries to tempt him with food because he's been fasting. And Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then he tries to tempt him with, with, with worship. And he says, fall down and worship me and I give you everything that you can see all over the place. And Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And then he says, listen here, if, 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 if you just go up there and throw yourself down, I know that the Bible says that God will give his angels charge over you so that you don't dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus says, it is written, don't tempt the Lord your God. And every time the enemy came against Jesus, Jesus spoke the word. 
and the enemy had to back up and flee. I don't know why you're trying to cuss your enemy like your enemy cuss you. I wish you get some word in you and you find out that no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper and that the Lord will make your enemies your footstool. Can I get six witnesses right along in here? I like it. I like it. That's good by itself. But now he's got crowds of people who are gathering all around him. By the time you get to chapter 5, you find out that there's a man that has been brought to Jesus. They brought him on a mat because he's paralyzed. He can't walk. And when they bring him on the mat, your Bible says that people are standing around there. They're watching to see what Jesus is going to do. And Jesus literally says to him in, in chapter 5, verse 24, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this messes up all the Jewish people who are standing around because this is blasphemous in their eyes. And because he is speaking blasphemy, they want to now attack him and do him harm. And Jesus says, what's easier for me to say, be thou healed, rise, take up your mat and walk, or to say, son, your sins are forgiven. And in verse 24, Jesus says, I just wanted you to know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. Now, now everybody should have been shouting right there. Because everybody in here is guilty of sinning this past week since June started. But somebody ought to be grateful that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sin. I need to find the people in here who know you have failed and fallen, but you're likewise forgiven to thank God that he has authority to forgive sin. That's chapter 5. Read over to chapter 6. And when you get to chapter 6, you'll find out that there's a man with a shriveled hand. Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And while he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, these, his naysayers, his detractors, are trying to find a reason to come after him. And they are trying to see if Jesus is going to heal the man on the Sabbath day. Their laws say that he's not supposed to do any work, not supposed to heal on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus does not lay his hands on him. All that Jesus does is say, stretch out your hand. And when the man who had had a shriveled hand for an extended period of time stretched out his hand, your Bible says his hand was restored. Because one word from the Lord, I said one word from the Lord, can, 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 can turn your whole life around. One, one word, one word from the Lord. And so Jesus is showing the authority of his word. So by the time you get to chapter 7, the centurion has thought about the fact that Jesus is on his way to his house. And the centurion sends some friends to Jesus to intersect the elders who are with Jesus and the large crowd. He said, and he said, listen, Jesus, don't come under my roof. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I know what authority looks like. I'm a man under authority and I got some people under me who do what I tell them to do. So this is what I want you to do. Verse 7b, speak the word. And if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. I, I need six or seven people in here who still believe that the word of God has power to effectuate change in your life, to open up your mouth and begin to ask the Lord to speak a word in your situation that will turn some things around by the time you get to work tomorrow. Is there anybody in here who still believes that he can speak one word and your body will be healed? He can speak one word and your finances can be turned around. He can speak one word and your children will act right. He can speak one word and so will your spouse. He can speak a word and your whole world will be transformed. Can I get five people in here to open up your mouth, lift up your head and say, speak, Lord. Yeah. Oh, there's somebody who needs God to do something during the month of June. Yeah, there's somebody who needs God to turn some things around before the summer is over. Don't, don't you get it twisted. Your God is not like your boss. Your boss has limited power. Your boss has limited authority. But last time I checked your Bible, the Bible says all power in heaven and earth is in my hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need you to lift up your voice and believe that the God you serve is able to say a word, speak a word, and turn your life around. I like this. I'm, out, I'm almost done. I got one minute left on the clock, but can I give you one thing? One last thing and I'll be done. It's going to take me more than a minute to do it, but let me give it to you. I want to suggest 
that not only have we seen God's authority through Jesus Christ, not only have we seen these who have come to the Lord Jesus on behalf of these brothers, of, of this brother in who is sick and made a compelling argument, but I want to suggest that by the time you get to the end of the story, we're able to see Christ's amazement. Yeah. Christ's amazement. Somebody say amazement. amazement. Now, amazement is a, a theme that goes through the book of Luke. It really goes through the books of the Bible, that all the way through the Bible, from Genesis to the Revelation, you get opportunities to be amazed. And I don't know about you, but every day I look for the way the Lord is going to amaze me. Maybe that's not your story, but I need God to keep on showing me how much authority he really has. I just like to see it so I can brag on God. See what he did there? <laughs> see how you work, how he worked that out? You see how he made a way? My enemy thought it was over for me, but the Lord said not so. You see how he worked it out? I I'll admit it, I was amazed this week. I was amazed when I told you we were at the minister's conference. While we at the minister's conference, people all week long tell us they're praying for us. Thank you for, so much for your intercession. And then I, then I was listening to all these preachers. We had some great preaching last week. Uh, if, y'all, if, y'all, if you're preaching junkies like we are, we just sat there all day long and soaked up all this preaching. We heard, we heard Dr. Cynthia Hale, who's been here over and over again. She's the president of Hampton Minister's Conference, at least was this year, and she just did a wonderful job Monday. Then, and then we heard uh, your co-pastor, our co-pastor, Dr. Howard John Wesley. He was absolutely off the chain. That man was absolutely on a whole other level. And then we heard Dr. Raquel Letsom. She's a prophet and scholar. And then we heard, we heard from several other preachers, but then we heard from Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of Dr. Freddie Haynes. But Dr. Freddie Haynes amazed me. He started sharing a story that I knew of already, but I didn't know parts of it. He told the story about how the former president, Donald J. Trump, was convicted on 34 counts of uh, business fraud. I knew that. That was no big deal. I knew that. But then he kept telling the story, and he said that he was convicted in a New York City courthouse. I knew that. But then he said he was convicted in the exact same courthouse as the Central Park Five. Wait, wait. We now call them the exonerated five. Now, let me tell you what blessed me about this. He said that this, these brothers were exonerated in the same courthouse where Donald Trump spent the last several weeks, and he was convicted. And they were convicted in the same spot. What messed us up was Donald Trump was the one who took out full-page ads in the newspaper saying that these black and brown boys who were, con who were convicted of rape that they never committed or receive the death penalty. And they were locked up for years because there was pressure put on those who were in the legal system to make sure that these brothers took the fall for something they did not do. That was 1989, where they were convicted in that courtroom, in that courthouse. And this year, 2024, Donald J. Trump was convicted in the same spot. Now listen, 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 wait. I don't want to deal with being a person who applauds the downfall of anybody. I don't, I don't want harm to come to anybody, but I did read the scripture lesson for today. And if you read our daily scripture readings, you know that Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 reads like this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You better be real careful causing harm to God's people because if you watch that thing play out, it just might come back to you. Oh, say, say, when you don't dig a ditch for me, because if you dig one ditch, you better dig two because the second one you did just might be for you. Can I find seven people in here who can testify? I don't have to get my enemies like my enemies are trying to get me. I've got a God on my side. And if it takes from 1989 to 2024, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Satisfied. Woo. Woo. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so I was amazed. 
I was amazed. And if you read through scripture, you'll find out these folk are always amazed when Jesus starts talking, when Jesus starts operating. And by the time you get down to verse 9, you find out that Jesus gets amazed. The point of this message is not, not, not how we get amazed. The point of this message is how do we make Jesus amazed? Oh, come here. The point of this message is not your breakthrough today. The point of this message is believe in God till somebody else gets their breakthrough. Why are you not clapping as loud as you were clapping a few minutes ago? Can you trust God to help somebody else get through their situation? Can you believe God to work a miracle in your pew partner's life? Can you believe God to work a miracle in somebody's life up there in that balcony? Can you believe God to work a miracle in somebody's life up there in that choir stand? Can you believe God to put broken hearts back together again? Can you believe God for somebody else? The Bible says that when Jesus looked at the centurion, your Bible says he was amazed at this man's faith. He says, I've not seen this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. Wait, hold up. Y'all know what that means, don't you? Nowhere among the Jewish people have I seen this kind of faith. And would you believe, I'm closing my Bible, would you believe that there's only two times in all of recorded scripture where your Bible says Jesus was amazed? Two times. Luke chapter 7 is one time. But the other time that we find out Jesus is amazed is in Mark chapter 6, verse 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus goes to his hometown, Nazareth. And while he's there, he's trying to heal. He's trying to make people better. And the Bible says he could only heal a few sick folk. He could not do many miracles there. And the Bible says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Two times in Scripture where Jesus gets amazed. Mark chapter 6, he's amazed at the people's lack of faith. They're supposed to know him well. That's his hometown. They're the ones who claim they go to Bible study all the time. They're the ones who show up at church every Sunday. They're the ones who found Luke real fast. They didn't want to look at Leviticus at all. They're the ones who know all the songs of the church. They're the ones who shout at just the right time. They're the ones who are supposed to have it all together. And Jesus is amazed at their lack of faith. But when he looks at a centurion, that some folk call the other. They'll be guilty of xenophobia because they look at him as a Gentile and they don't think he can know Jesus the way that they know Jesus. But when that man puts his confidence in Jesus, he says, I've heard enough about you to believe that you can do what nobody else can do. I've heard your miracles are magnificent and magnanimous and I'm just going to believe that if you did it for them, you can do it for him, not me. You can do it for him. And I want to find the people in this church who still want to amaze Jesus on a Sunday afternoon. I want to find the people in church who say, I refuse to be guilty of a Mark chapter 6 kind of amazement. I want Jesus to be amazed because I trust him even when I can't trace him. I want Jesus to be amazed because I believe him even when everybody around me will doubt him. And can I find the ride or die believers in this church house? Somebody in that sanctuary who will testify that I believe God even when I don't understand the situations I'm going through. I I believe God even when my money is funny and all my bills are due. I believe God even when sickness has pervaded my body. I believe God even when my head is hung down in shame and I don't know how things are going to work out. I need somebody in here who's already seen him work miracles. You've already heard of his ability to make, make wonders happen. And because you know what he's able to do, you'll wait on him until your change comes. Because you know what he's able to do, you'll open up your mouth and say, do it, Jesus, do it. Fix it, Jesus, fix it. Work it out, Jesus, work it out. Can I find somebody in here who knows that he doesn't always come when you want him to? But they that wait, yes, Lord, upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not get weary, and they'll walk and not faint. Is there a witness up there in that balcony who's seen the Lord do enough in your history that you'll trust him for your legacy? I need somebody in here to testify. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I got enough faith by now to believe that the Lord is able to do it. I've heard enough preaching by now and to know that faith comes by hearing, yeah, and hearing by the word of God. And is there anybody who still believes that he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, 
light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. So I will trust you in the Lord until I die. Can I find somebody in here who will open up your mouth and say, have thine own way, Lord. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm praying for my sister and I'm praying for my brother. You need, they need you to pull them through and fight their battles. And this is what I'm going to do. When you bless them, I'm going to bless you. Can I find somebody in here who will bless God because he blessed your pew partner, because he blessed your neighbor, because he bless somebody in your family. I need somebody that doesn't have to wait until you get a blessing to do all the shouting. But since he's still standing and since the losses are still coming to church, you got reason to rejoice on a Sunday afternoon. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord if you know he's a miracle worker. If you know he'll make a way out of no way. Somebody ought to holler, say the word, Jesus. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. At some point in our lives, we have to grow past lights and thunder and bells and whistles. We just got to trust the word. That the word will still work to effectuate change in our very lives. There's a word that somebody needed today. And the Lord said, I got you. I know where you are. I know what, you, what you're going through. And the word to you is, trust me. I can handle this better than you can. Trust me. I can deal with this better than you can. Trust me. I know what you need even more than you know what you need. And the Bible says that the servant was healed from that very hour. Jesus never got to the house, never laid his hand on the brother. He just spoke a word and the man's life was totally transformed. I love you. I love you. That's why we do all this preaching and teaching at Wheeler Avenue. Because you never know what word you need spoken over your life to transform your life. That's why I tell the church all the time, preaching time ain't no sleeping time. Wake yourself up. Shake yourself. You need a word for your certain circumstance. Because none of us know what's going to happen between Monday and Saturday time we get back here ain't no telling what might jump off what might go down but if you got some word to hold on to it will radically redefine how you how you react to certain circumstances I, I thank God for his word I've got to stop but I appreciate the fact that all of us today can intercede on behalf of somebody else and believe God for their miracle for their breakthrough I'm not going to ask you to turn toward nobody and ask them how can I pray for you I'm just going to believe you're going to pray for somebody other than yourself, other than your family, other than